everybody, this is Taylor Sparks. Welcome back to my Materials Informatics series. Now today, we're gonna dive into generative machine learning models. And specifically, we're gonna dive into generative adversarial networks as the first of the different models that are out there. So let's get started. We benefit in the, the world of materials informatics of being adjacent to computer scientists who are doing all the real heavy lifting for us in coming up with cool new uh, machine learning models and algorithms for generating new things, right? So we have the benefit of using things like GANs, VAEs, flow-based models, diffusion models, and I'll describe what all of those are in the next series of videos um, in this series. Uh, but today's video is going to talk about the GAN, the Generative Adversarial Network. And to kick it off, let's start with this tweet. This came from a tweet from the inventor of the GAN, um, a guy named Ian Goodfellow, who invented it back in 2014 when he was a PhD student, I think it was at the University of Montreal. How awesome is that? Grad student invented this. Um, and he posted you know, this tweet showing the progress, how you know they were interested in using GANs to create faces like you see on the left here. And he showed over the series of just four years the incredible progress in making these really realistic faces. I added the one on the right, in 2021 and now in 2024 my gosh they're doing videos and all sorts of other incredible things so gans have proven a really really valuable tool and in the short you know period of 10 years we've man like it's been a phenomenal tool and it's been used like crazy including in material science which will be our next video so let's dive into how gans work what are they how do they do what they do so GAN stands for Generative Adversarial Network, right? And it's the adversarial part that really makes them perform so well. It's also the reason why they are so frustrating to use, more on that later. Um, but at their simplest, they start with two different neural networks. And the first is a discriminator. And the discriminator, all it is, is a classifier, right? It's a straight up classifier where, again, the classifier's job is to classify things like, you know, that's a picture of a bird and that's a picture of a car. Well, this time what it's classifying is, oh, that's a real data point and that's a fake data point. So the idea is that you're going to pass into your discriminator real samples from some sort of distribution or database. In our case, since we're doing material science, that might be like a crystal structure database or that could be real pictures of microstructures or that could be real formulas, right? And then we're also going to pass it fake ones, right? And the discriminator's job is to figure out real or fake and get it right. And if it gets it wrong, then the loss function, right, gets imposed to, via backpropagation, update the weights of the neural network so that it gets better at its job, okay? And so the typical thing that you'll see at the end of the discriminator is something like a sigmoid function, right? Um, and we've talked about sigmoid functions before. They're this really great, you know, sigmoid shape that allows, if it's a negative, if the final node of your neural network, for example, is a negative number, then it flattens to a zero. And if it's a really positive number, it goes to a one. And there's only this little region in the middle where there's any ambiguity, which makes them a good classifier. It's a good discriminator, um, okay? So these are great, but this is just a classifier. This isn't gonna generate anything new. Instead, it tries to learn something about the underlying distribution from which the data is sampled. Now, what do I mean by that? And why can't it generate something new? Let's, let's look at this example, which comes from Computer Files, great video on GANs. Let's consider these three different data samples that I've generated here. Now you can see that there is a sort of underlying pattern to all of these three individual samples, right? And that's the fact that this is sort of like a sinusoidal oscillation, right? And so what we are asking the classifier to do is figure out that underlying distribution, right? Which might look something like this red line on the bottom left. But then if you were to use that learned distribution and try and generate new data points, it might look something like this. The data points are gonna sit right on top of that line because the classifier doesn't know how to add variance to this. It doesn't know how to add the noise that we need to make this look like a real sample, right? What we want it to do is spit out something like this, where it's, it's more or less obeying the underlying distribution, but there's some realism to it. It looks like a real sample, and a classifier alone is not gonna be able to do that. So clever people like Ian Goodfellow and company came up with this clever idea to what they, they basically said, well, what if you have one model that learns the distribution and another that tries to generate things that match that distribution and you pit these two things against one another and thus was born the generative adversarial network. So in this model, you see, it looks like what we had before, partly, you still have this uh, database of real materials that get passed to a discriminator whose job is still to figure out real from fake, 
But instead of starting with some database of fake materials, we're going to use another neural network, our generator, to generate fake samples, right? So this could be fake compounds, fake images, whatever it is we're talking about. It's gonna generate fake versions, and the discriminator job is going to be to tell the real from the fake, and the catch is this. The loss function is going to apply to both neural networks, right? The loss function, in one case, the discriminator wants to do a really good job at correctly classifying real versus fake, but the discriminator wants to do a really good job at fooling the discriminator such that it does a bad job on classifying real versus fake. And so we're gonna take information from the loss function when it gets it right or when it gets it wrong, and we're gonna use that to do back propagation to both of these models sort of separately. Um, but the benefit here is that once you get this trained and working well, well then you could take random noise, which sort of represents our chemical white space, um, and we'll talk about how to impose constraints on that in a later video on optimization. But essentially, in comes random noise, out comes a realistic looking structure or microstructure, or whatever it is about the materials. And as the better the generator gets and the better the discriminator gets, they start to pit one against another. The, the classic example is always that of like a, a con artist and a forger. Or, uh, sorry, a con artist and a detective. So the con artist might, might want to make fake paintings of, you know, whatever, Monet or whatever. Picasso, and yet the discriminator is going to be our detective, is going to want to do a better job of catching the con artist. And the better the detective is, the better the con artist must be, and vice versa. This adversarial training allows these two to pit against one another. And that's kind of honestly how, how humans work, right? When I'm teaching my kids to speak or do different things, I'm also I'm pointing out the things that they get wrong, and we are constantly challenging them as they learn to speak and walk and things to focus on the things that they're not doing quite as well, right? So it's a really great opportunity. But it's also what we call a min-max gain. What do we mean by a min-max gain? Well, if you look at the loss function, right, when something comes out of the discriminator and we assess whether it got it right or wrong, we can actually define a loss function for both our discriminator D and our generator G. So the loss function is gonna be V here. And what it essentially is showing you is two different terms. And the first term is showing you the discriminator's prediction on real data. How effective is it? The second term is going to be its prediction on fake data. How good is it at catching the fakes, right? If you dig into here, E sub X, where X is taken from a distribution of data, right? This is our, X is going to represent our real data. So the expectation when you send it real data to the discriminator, hence D of X, right? When we take log of that term, we want it to be high, right? In other words, we want it to correctly uh, uh, classify real data. However, the expectation when you send it fake data, denoted as Z from some distribution of fake data, we want that to be 1 minus the log of D of G of Z. So what is this D of G of Z? Well, remember, the, the noise, Z, gets passed to our generator first, hence why well, it's G of Z first. That is now generating a fake sample. G of Z is the fake sample. And we then pass that to the discriminator. So D of G of Z is the evaluation on that fixed sample. So we want that to be low, right? We don't want it to fall for that. Hence why it's one minus that log term. Um, and it's interesting because now we have this scenario where the discriminator and the generator are doing two different things. The discriminator, for example, wants to maximize this V expression while the generator wants to minimize V. Okay, so hence the mathematical expression for how we write this is min g max d. So let's see how this looks when we actually go through training. The training steps, you know, just like when you train a neural network that it's done in epochs where you're showing the data continuous over and over, we have the same opportunity here. We're gonna do k number of steps. Think of this like the number of epochs you're going to go through. And during each epoch, you don't train necessarily a single image. You could train multiple images or multiple structures, whatever your representation is. So we're going to train um, m number of noise samples. We start out with m number of noise samples, and we turn those into fake data by passing them through our generator. Meanwhile, we're gonna take m number of real samples, so x now instead of z, and those represent real data, so we pull those from, from some real database. We're going to use both of those, and we're going to use them to generate and update our discriminator by ascending the gradient. So we take that loss function that we saw before, right, this one, now we take the derivative with respect to the different uh, network that's in use here. So for example, here we're taking the gradient with respect to X and Z, our input samples, and we're seeing how the parameters of our discriminator change 
as we go through the different batch of things. So we're looking at the log of how well it performs at discriminating real samples and the log of one minus how well it does at discriminating fake samples. Okay. Then we're going to go to our next step because we're going to train these models sequentially. This time we're going to look at the noise samples that we transformed with our generator and we're going to update our generator by descending the gradient, right? So this time we're taking the, the, the gradient, right, with respect to the generator, the parameters of the, grade, of the generator, and you'll notice that when we do that, there's no generator in this first term. So we can actually ignore this first term which is kind of interesting, which is just another way of saying that when we update the parameters of the generator, we don't need real samples at all. We only need Z, our noise samples that get generated. That's all we need to generate the generator. So there, there's some more math that goes along with this that some people look into. For example, you can there's a proof that shows that you can minimize G, right? G, the, the loss function gets minimized if and only if the distribution from which you're sampling data, your noise samples, um, matches real data, right? So if you don't have that, then you can't perfectly minimize it. But the challenge here is that you've got two different things that are essentially being trained and they, it's like a tug of war between them. That leads to some interesting challenges. And in practice, working with GANs can be kind of a pain. So for one thing, GANs are really good at what they do. If you train them and they converge and you get it you know, working correctly, they are among the most powerful generative models that are out there. They can create really high quality, realistic, fake data. However, they do suffer from this uh, training instability. So what's going on? Why is it unstable? Well, there's a couple reasons. First off, we have what's called a non-convex game, which is just a mathy way of saying that there's not a single global solution. There can be local solutions as opposed to a global optimum. There can be local optimums. And so how do you know if you found the best solution or just a local one? That's non-convex, right? You also have this problem of Nash equilibrium in this non-convex game, where a Nash equilibrium comes from game theory. And it's essentially saying in, if there's a strategy game where there's two different players that are competing, um, Nash equilibrium says that there's no way to benefit a single player in changing their strategy if the other player doesn't change their strategy. In other words, the generator and the, the discriminator are pitted against one another and there's this constant tension as they're trying to um, improve by seeing the other one change their approach, right? You run into this problem of mode collapse where a certain solution turns out maybe to be really good at fooling the discriminator. The generator comes up with a clever way to trick the discriminator and it's so clever that the discriminator never figures it out. And so the generator never has a reason to change something. So it might create a certain type of structure that fooled it. And then it will just keep on making variations on that certain type. And that's mode collapse because we want it to explore the whole breadth of potential solutions, but it might get stuck in a single one. That happens. There's something called vanishing gradient. So if your discriminator is outperforming, then your generator's gradient vanishes and therefore your generator can't learn, which makes the discriminator even better, which is like a feedback loop that makes this even worse. And the other way around, you can have exploding gradient. If your generator is outperforming, well then your discriminator's loss escalates and that gradient explodes and you have the same problem. So there's this real balancing act, and this is the challenge with uh, GANs. You might be training them for a week, and then all of a sudden it will diverge, right? You want it to converge and get to your whatever, you, you hope it's the, optim the global solution, but you don't know. But you're hoping it's a good solution as it converges, but it might diverge, which is frustrating when you've been watching it train for a week and all of a sudden you lose your progress, right? And there's also a lot of sensitivity to hyperparameters. Your learning rate, the batch size, the architectures that you use, these are all totally tunable things. And so that can be really challenging. So what can we do to make GANs in general work better? Well, first off, there are alternative loss functions. Remember the discriminator uses typically a sigmoid um, and sigmoids are good discriminators, but they also approach asymptotes as it gets really fake data or really real data, it approaches an asymptote. And I'll show you this in my next slide, uh, in my next video in the series when we talk about applications and materials that that can be a problem because you get this vanishing gradient. Um, there are regularization techniques where you sort of penalize it for using too many features or trying to prevent it from overfitting. And there's also lots of different architectures, in particular things like conditional GANs or Wasserstein GANs, more on those in the next video. And these give additional information to the generator or discriminator that can make them perform a little bit better. So with our foundation set for how GANs work, Let's dive into our next video, which is how GANs have been used in material science.